Hey guys, welcome back to the CXG Podcast. This is episode 12. I'm Josh from Games of War. I'm joined by my co-host as always, Corn Muffin. Joe, how you doing? I am doing all right. That's good. It's a good, it's a summer night. We're all doing all right. We've got a very special guest tonight. Um, the creator and the guy that's going to be bringing us a brand new cartridge-based console. Mike Kennedy's in the house. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Thanks for having me on your show. It's, it's good to have you here. I'm, I'm pretty excited for this console, and I'm excited to talk to you about it because uh, there have been a lot of questions about it. I think a lot of people are interested, but they're also mm-hmm. not quite as up on it as they'd like to be. So mm-hmm. hopefully this will give you a chance to get it out there and give us a chance to hear about more about a new console that's cartridge-based, and I think everybody's excited yeah. about it. I hope so. Most definitely. Now... Um, starting things off at the most basic thing, I think everybody knows that's somewhat followed the story or has seen uh, pictures of what's going on, that you were able to obtain the Atari Jaguar molds, and that's what you're using for the look of the console. Yeah. But the controller's all new, right? right. You guys, mm-hmm. Now, if that's something you could elaborate more on, like yeah. in terms of the controller, um, where, where did you like source your ideas from, or where, where did you get the the basic info on how you wanted to put the controller together? That's that's an important part of a console, there, the controller. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it can <clears throat> make or break systems, um, and uh, we've seen it all. You know, we've seen it happen before, and and um, so yeah. So we, I guess, going back to the Jag console, just to touch on that, just briefly. So I've been kind of following the whereabouts of that tooling for the last few years. Um, I think I was aware of it initially when uh, I was on Atari age and they were talking about it in the Jaguar forums about the tooling being put up for sale on eBay. This was probably four, four or five years ago, something like that. And, um, it, they never sold, although there was uh, lots of chatter in the Atari age forums. Uh, and I'm sure maybe some other forums too, about figuring out a way to save this tooling from, from just being recycled, you know, discarded, d- destroyed, um, but ultimately, uh, the, the people were talking about pooling their money together to, to save these things and everything else. And in the end, it was just, no, nobody bought it. It's 9,000 pounds of steel. You know, where are you going to put this stuff in your house, in your garage or, or, or whatever. So I think it kind of fell apart when the, you know, the logistics came into play from shipping these things and, and everything else. And, but uh, luckily for me, they weren't too far away. I'm in Southern California. They were up in the Bay Area, so uh, you know, it wasn't too far away. And, and so I ended up getting in touch with the uh, dental company that had uh, bought these from Atari back in the late, eight, uh, uh, late 90s and had repurposed it as a dental uh, camera uh, machine of some sort. And uh, it turns out you know, they weren't using them anymore, and that's why they put them up on eBay a few years ago. And uh, luckily, to this day, uh, when I went there last December, just not too long ago, uh, they still had them. They hadn't destroyed them yet, and and so for for whatever reason, they've they've been kept around, you know, this earth um, until some crazy person uh, came by and bought them, which uh, was me, I guess. And um, so I went up there in December and and uh, met with the the guy who owns the company and and bought the tooling and it was some you know heard some really interesting stories of of that whole process and and in the in the process of becoming the new owners of this tooling I got all of the original uh, deep D sized big blueprints of the Atari Jaguar that that Atari had and and uh, some pretty interesting documentation that uh, that went along with that and uh, most importantly we got the letters. Uh, basically um, relieving Atari of all rights, titles, and interest in that design and um, and everything else. So I got all of that as part of my purchase. Um, and uh, ultimately, that has saved us somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, a quarter of a million to $300,000 in uh, development, engineering and development costs. Um and, uh, and tooling costs. So it's it's really the reason I'm able to to take the risk and to bring out a product like this. If it wasn't for that, uh, we wouldn't be talking. This product wouldn't be coming out. So we can, whether we love the Jaguar or hated the Jaguar, uh, if we like what this is all about, it's we can thank the Jaguar for this and, and just thank uh, thank God that, that, this, that the tooling was never destroyed like probably other every other bit of uh, tooling ever was for any other old console that was out there. Um, but, uh, speaking of the controller, um, we did not get the tooling for the controller. Uh, even if we did, uh, probably wouldn't have used it. Um, 
Thank I, God. Thank yeah, God. I, I, I always liked. I, I mean, I thought the Jag controller was okay. Um, I had big, bigger hands, I guess, at the time, and, and was a, an adult when that product was out. So, I kind of always thought it was kind of comfortable. But, I, I'm with you there, um, Mike. I, I, as an original Jaguar owner, I, uh, <laughs> I didn't mind that controller. I think like. It it only became a real issue when there when you when it used all the buttons where you had to yeah, use an yeah. overlay, but yeah. for for the most part it wasn't like an incredibly uncomfortable to hold controller. No. It's just the the button layout was like the same yeah. as if you remember the Atari fifty two hundred had that same button layout. Yes, um, horrible. It's pretty similar. I mean, I think I know what they I know what they were going for with the controller. It just yeah. it's unwieldy. Yeah. Well, you yeah. know, at that point, you were they were competing with PCs that had lots of buttons and and uh, everything else. I mean, of course, the Intellivision, the ColecoVision had a, a similar system um, that really, I mean, it was most effective on the Intellivision. They exploited it better than anybody, although, you know, that wasn't the best controller in the world either. Although people that love Intellivision love the controller. So, you know, it just kind of depends what you had and what you loved when you were growing up and everything. So uh, I certainly won't diss it. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, when they had like Doom coming out on this thing and some other things that um, I think it was just sort of, you know, they wanted more buttons just to say, hey, we've got buttons too, you know, or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, it was um, it was the D-pad for me that just didn't feel right. Like holding the the controller, it wasn't like it was horribly uncomfortable. And I kind of dug the, the the keypad with like the overlays. Mm. It, like in theory, it it was cool and it looked cool. It was just for me, it was the the D-pad and a lot of the games they were trying to do, I uh, just didn't the D-pad didn't feel right. Not to mention it sounded like a an old box spring on the you know bed, yeah. but. You know, in terms of an actual controller holding it, it wasn't uncomfortable. You're, I'll give you yeah. guys that. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so we didn't get that. We did get the cartridge shell, and, you know, we can talk about that later, and, and the console shell. So that's what we're repurposing. Uh, of course, we're putting all new, you know, innards and guts into this thing and updating it. I mean, you know, big time. Um, but as far as the controller goes, I was trying to think, you know, what do we want to do for a controller? Um, we're trying to keep the cost down. I mean, it's a little obvious. Some, you know, we're getting some criticism because we're kind of just copying this and copying that, and everything else. But again, that's the way I'm doing it. I mean, that's that's the affordable way. That's a way for me to to launch this thing without having to sell my soul to investors or VC. Of course, they'd probably all laugh at me at this point. Anyway, so uh, again, it's just this is the way I've chosen to do it. Keep the cost down. Um, and uh, keep that startup, you know, the startup cost down and whatnot. And so it's just worked out very, very well to get this stuff and repurpose it. But um, as far as the controller goes, you know, we're kind of trying to do the same thing with that. I, uh, a few months ago, I was trying to envision kind of what might, what this controller would look like. What do I want to see in it? I've talked to lots of developers. What do they want to see in it? And um, I had this vision in my mind of basically what we've got, which is kind of a dual analog stick controller that looked like it was married up with a you know, uh, modern day, uh, or a dual analog stick controller married up with a super NES gamepad. And so I was flipping through one of the issues of my, ma of our magazine, uh, issue two or three, February, March of last year. And we do a swag bag section in there, a couple of pages, uh, just showing off, you know, cool video game products and stuff. And, and, uh, we had written about the, uh, Atari pro U, uh, or the Wii pro U controller. Uh, I'm sorry. And I saw this and I thought, my God, that's exactly what I see in my mind when I picture a controller for this thing. And um, so I got in touch with Innerworks. And of course, we've had a lot of criticism about this controller that it didn't, you know, it didn't work real well with the Wii. I think it had a lot of connectivity issues. But uh, generally, it feels solid. And we're not going to be wireless. We're going to be USB. So it is going to be a wired controller with a nice long cable on it. Um, so I don't think we're going to have those same types of issues. Um, they have had issues with the D pad, um, and we're working with them now, hopefully trying to see if they've worked through some of that, some of those issues. Um, but bottom line is we're, we're getting a controller. We're going to beat the living hell out of it. I mean, we are going to put this thing through its, uh, its paces and, and just basically try to destroy the thing. Um, and see what happens. And, uh, you know, it's very important to us to have a controller that, that's going to last and, and uh, be responsive um, because uh, retro games require, um, you know, a very responsive controller. And 
And that's what we want to make sure that we've got. Now, if people don't like our controller, hey, I mean, they can plug in any other USB device they want. So it's it's not like you have to use this controller or nothing else. So I think that's going to be good, uh, although we want this to be a good controller. Um, but people will have other options. Um, did, did you think of going, okay, I know you've got like the, um, almost like the, like you said, the Wii U Pro controller, and that's mm -hmm. pretty much what it's like. Mm -hmm. And you know, the PlayStation has a similar, where the analogs are the same level. Did you ever think of going with like an Xbox kind of, where one thumbstick is up high and one is down low. Right. Did you ever consider that kind of? I really haven't. Um, not that it would be a bad design. We've had other people mention that. I mean, we've had pros and cons. Uh, you know, any controller we bring out is not going to fit everybody's needs. You know, everybody's going to bitch about something about it. Just, All right. It's the, way, it's the way gamers are. We're like, we're the hardest crowd to, to satisfy. So, um, and again, it's it's more like this is available. They're going to rebrand it. Um and, and we're going to go with it. And, you know, we may, depending on the demand of this thing, uh, come out with new and original controllers for this of various types and arcade sticks. I mean, who the hell knows? Um, a lot of it will just sort of depend on the demand that, that is uh, revealed when this Kickstarter kicks off. Um, and, uh, you know, if there's high demand and, and this thing is a booming success and we sell tons and tons of these in that, that campaign period, then I think that the sky is the limit for the types of products we want to and accessories we want to bring out for it. Yeah. Um, we're all retro gamers. I mean, I've been gaming since the seventies and, you know, we have Steve Wade on my team who was, you know, making games on the Atari. He did, uh, he's made Sega Genesis games. He's made uh, Nintendo NES games. Um, it's really important to him that, that this thing is, uh, like the best product that we've all dreamed of. Um, and that it'll, it'll last for years and, years and years and years and years and years and years down the road. So we're really taking our time to build longevity into this thing and, and create a product that's going to be around 30, 40, 50 years from now, uh, at least in some form, meaning you can plug this thing in and play it and it doesn't have to ping some dead server um, and essentially make the system a brick. Um so again, it's really important to us that, uh, and and we believe that this system will have longevity because unlike the modern day systems and, and every system up to this point that has to every five or six years or seven years come out with a bigger, faster, better, this and that and the other thing, we don't have to because that's not what this system's about. Um, we want to, we're creating a system that literally is going to play games that developers make that maybe is, uh, you know, an eight bit era game right up to potentially a PS2 era game. And heck, this thing may even play the likes of the Mighty Number no. Nines and uh, some of these big Kickstarter games, Thimbleweed Park, we're talking to Ron um, Gilbert about bringing Thimbleweed Park out on this thing on cart. Um, you know, we we think that this thing will end up playing some of, the, some of the games that are only available via streaming or digital downloads on the modern day consoles, but in a physical product that we can collect and gamers can continue to play years down the road on the original hardware. So, you know, this isn't going to be a toy. This isn't going to be, you know, a Chinese, you know, a China made, uh, paper thin. Um, I mean, this thing is going to be as next generation as you're going to get without an operating system and a PC under the hood. I mean, uh, or, a you know, a, you know, an Xbox 360 or an Xbox one or PS4 type situation. I mean, it's, it, it's going to be as high tech as a cartridge based system could ever be. And um, it's going to have just tons of capability and flexibility that developers are going to just trust me. They're going to be all over this thing. And and we're getting developers, you know, falling over backwards, getting in touch with us about this thing. So it's uh, bringing games onto this thing is not going to be uh, real difficult, I don't think, as a lot of people think it would be, because, like, who's going to make a game for this? Uh, that's one of the most common questions I've seen in the forums. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but. Um, I don't know. Did I answer a question in there someplace? <laughs> there, yeah. yeah. Question about the uh, controller. Um, is the controller going to be a rumble base? Is it going to have rumble in it? No. 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 It's it's going to be uh, just a standard kind of yeah, yeah. designed not on the Wii. Not to say it won't ever happen, but the the initial controller will not be correct. Okay. That that was one of the questions from that was sourced about the controller. Um, people were wondering if it would have. Uh, rumble but no i guess is the answer so um you mentioned a lot about the uh the non-updatability of that you don't want it to have to be a console that needs updates yeah and yeah. 
Um, I think that's that's a good idea. But w- what are you going to do with, you know, because a lot of times games do come out and they're mm-hmm. they're broken. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Are are you going to? I mean, f- for example, Nintendo had like their kind of seal of, seal of quality on it yeah. to uh to, g- to give like a quality control kind mm-hmm. of thing. Are you going to do something similar with this so that we don't Definitely. get cartridges yeah. that have yeah. horrible bugs in them that can't be fixed? For sure, for sure. Um, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right? I mean, you know, we don't want to connect to the internet, and and um, um, you know, growing up with the games and all the cart. I mean, I played lots of games over my you know 45, 46 years, and and honestly, I growing up with cartridge-based consoles, I can't think of one time where I had I owned a game that was unplayable or there was a bug that was so bad it, it destroyed the, the the enjoyment of the game. I mean it just never happened. And um you know these days it's it's a common occurrence uh which is bullshit, <laughs> you know. I mean uh you saw you know Arkham Knight just came out and it's you know people are just pissed. I mean there's things you know it's there's shit not working with it and people are just like are, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. You know. And it's just bullshit and you know, and I can understand it with these AAA games. They got, you know, these enormous teams and, you know, nobody knows what, you know, this person and that. There's so many people involved. Shit falls through the cracks. Um, but generally speaking, with the types of games that we're going to be bringing out, which could be large scale retro influenced and retro looking games, but they could be, you know, massive games. Um, but generally, they're smaller teams. I think there's a lot more... Um, uh, you know, they're a lot more careful putting, you know, uh, putting these games out and everything. But definitely, I mean, these things, when a developer turns a game over to us, I mean, they pretty much got to turn us over, turn over to us a bug free game. We're going to test the living hell out of the game as well. Uh, so um, the games that we're publishing, that we're selling, um, I mean, we're really starting out real similar to how Nintendo started out, as, as you as you brought up. I mean, we're going to be publishing the games. Uh, we're going to be marketing and selling the games um, direct to consumer, probably for the first year via our website. Um, and we're going to be very diligent on, on these types of issues because we, we just can't have those types of problems. And we believe that, that, um, there are developers out there that can still, um, turn in, you know, a bug free game ultimately. Um, and it, you know, they need to work all of that, those types of things out. And, and those are the games we'll be bringing out. So, um, the other thing too, is a lot of the games we'll bring out may be, um, games that are already available. Um, that have been maybe available via digital or streaming, um, you know, uh, and by the time they get onto our system in a year, when we actually ship and deliver, all the bugs should be worked out by then. So that's kind of another plus for the games that are currently out that are popular retro games. Um, you know, I guarantee you, like if we bring out, uh, if we talk to Brian and bring out Retro City Rampage, the version we get is not going to have any bugs in it. I mean, he's that thing's been around the block, right? The bugs are worked out of it. So by the time we put it onto a cartridge, it should be pretty bug free. Um, and so I think that's definitely going to be a big plus for some of the existing uh, titles that we bring onto it, uh, in you know, onto cartridge for the first time. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, you know, we'll certainly have kind of some sort of a seal of approval, um, on the games that we are selling directly. Um, and that's really the, 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 that's pretty much the, the, the games are going to be sold for this system. Now we've talked about kind of open sourcing this thing. So other de- small, you know, really small, uh, homebrew developers, maybe they are making their first game and they want to buy 50 copies on a cartridge to sell at an expo or put on eBay or sell on their to friends or however they want to sell it and distribute it. Um, we would probably, we'd like to, to offer that. Um, because number one, everybody that they sell that game to would have to have our console. So that it would marry more people to the console. And, um, you know, this is a situation where we wouldn't, we would just, they'd say we'd have a minimum, minimum orders. Like you get it. There's, you will say a 50 copies for X amount and we'll, we'll make the boxes. We'll do the instruction book, but it'll be very clearly labeled that this is a, uh, a title that is not published by us. And, uh, the cartridge will look different. Um, you know, obviously different, different color or something like that. And these are things we're still working out, but, but we'd like to give that, that, that level of developer, um, maybe somebody that's just got out of school that's making a first game and they want to preserve it on a cartridge, um, give them the opportunity to do that, but just make sure that, that 
everybody in the outside world understands that there's kind of two levels of games here. And hey, if somebody brings us a game in that way and they want to put it on a cartridge and they want to buy 50 copies and we look at it and say, we think we can sell 20,000 of these to our, to our you know, growing user base, we'll do a royalty deal, a publishing deal with them uh, if we think it's good enough and bring it to the masses and then kind of then do a royalty deal and officially publish it. But um, we really want to help publishers, I mean, developers of all sizes out and give them an outlet um, kind of an official outlet and kind of an unofficial kind of sub outlet where they can kind of just uh, sell their own games to their friends or anybody that might want to buy them at that level too. So um, we want to try to figure that out. Now, a quick question. Um, you're talking about like the releases and um, games that have met the, 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 qual- the quality mm-hmm. um, standards. Are you shooting for games to be released like fully with nice color manuals and yeah, Maybe cardboard boxes, or are you going to try to go maybe like the way of the clamshell, like with the Sega Genesis? Yeah, we're, we, or... we're, we're leaning towards clamshell. Um, we're still, you know, pricing all that stuff out. Um, I mean, frankly, cardboard uh, NES-style boxes are very inexpensive. I think we're down around to a, a quarter a box, uh, even with like a 5,000 quantity. Very, very inexpensive. Um, and so I don't think the clamshell are going to kill us. I think, um, I, I know personally, I would prefer clamshell. Um, also, uh, being the fact that we may not have end labels on these cartridges, we may, we may not at this point, but, you know, to have them in a nice, uh, collectible case that you can store easily on your shelf is certainly, um, a compromise. Mm-hmm. And, um, so far, you know, the feedback that we've been getting is that, that is, uh, that would work. Um, so we're leaning towards, uh, plastic time sale. Okay. And is there, is there a certain... Like art design in mind. So, you know, when you have like all your Genesis games lined up, yeah. obviously there's the early grid, you know, the black yeah. and the gray grid. Yeah. Then they switched yeah. over to like the more uh, yeah. red with like kind of the, the stripes down it. Uh, are you guys going to go for like a unified look? In I think so, of- definitely. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we want this system to have an identity uh, regardless of the, the all the different types of games that could come out on this. Uh, definitely the games that are be- being published uh, and sold directly through our channel will will all um, you'll be able to tell it's a retro VGS game, okay. published game. Yeah, that's cool. Definitely. Now, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, real quick, was uh, something I've seen brought up quite a bit whenever I've done any reading, and is that I'm assuming that the the console mold is final. There's not going to be any like dust flaps added to that's the. Correct. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, and we've talked about that. Um, you know, uh, you can leave your least favorite game in the cartridge slot, or maybe we'll sell a blank cartridge um, that's just specifically meant to plug in when you're not playing it. That really takes care of it. Okay. Um, you know, at this point, you know, maybe we'll make it a stretch goal. Who knows? But uh, I think we can get by w- without it uh, at this point. And, and, you know, certainly if it adds any considerable cost to the, the in, to the tooling design, which pretty much any time you sneeze on the, 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 this tooling, it, it costs you money. Yeah. Um, and uh, we already have to modify the cartridges because, as we all know, the, jet, the JAG cartridges have Atari, you know, embossed in the back of it. So, that, you know, we're already having to deal with that and to pull that out and uh and make changes that way so we, we already do have some expense that, that will be involved with modifying those cartridges so so for right now i i think uh, it, it's all going to be pretty much locked down the way that it is okay so um i, I had some questions about the the hardware itself mm-hmm. um i'm wondering first i'm wondering about the cartridges is the main thing how how are the cartridges being made are they may being made like um, with e- EEPROMs and uh, like on a, on an actual board, or are you? I mean, or is it going to be like some? Is it going to? I'm worried that it's going to be an SD card adapter or something. With, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean it's going to have um, you know a, a, a similar cartridge um, uh, PCB in there that you're familiar with. You know that that's going to drop into the slot. Um, we're going to use. We're looking at two different types of cartridge formats depending on the size of the game. Um, we're looking at, um, I mean, here's the deal. Mass ROMs are on the outs. They've been on the outs forever. And unless you're buying just crazy mass quantities of them, um, which we won't initially, it, they're just not cost effective. And we've talked to one of the leading suppliers of mass ROMs uh, in the U.S. here, and they're phasing it out. Um, and so it's just really not an option for us. But, I mean, we all understand that that that, that is the best way. You know, but it's just... It's just not doable. So we've kind of we pushed that out, and so we've been looking at a variety of type of, of flash technology. Um, but um, 
you know, there's hundred year flash. Uh, we're not using just cheap flash. I mean, you know, it's, it's very important to our team that these cartridges, you know, when you plug it in in 50 years, that the thing's going to work. Um, and so we've been spending a lot of time and I'm not a hardware guy, you know, and, and I've, that's what I've told everybody. I'm not, you know, we've got, I've got two guys that are doing all of the hardware design on this thing that are experts. They work for Sony and Apple and, and, um, they're again, the retro gamers at heart. They're, they're trying to build this system, um, to be a love letter to every cartridge based system that's come before it. And one that's, you know, just infinitely, um, expandable and, and flexible for developers. So, um, it's going to, when you buy the cartridge, it's just going to look like your standard everyday cartridge, you know, with the keyed, um, you know, cartridge in it. And it's going to drop into the cartridge slot and, okay. you know, you won't know any different, but, what uh, but the, it is, uh... it's going to be flash. And then the other option the other, for the larger games, because, you know, we, there's flash for about any size you want to put on this thing. But when you start talking, um, you know, these 500 meg games or one gig games. I mean, it, the flash really gets expensive and it basically hikes the price of these cartridges up to, you know, 80 to a hundred dollars, which nobody's going to pay. Um, and so once we hit a certain threshold, we're going to switch to a, a mini, mini disc system inside the cartridge that, uh, you know, we're all, we're, we've always said we're not going to have any moving parts or anything like this, but you know, you start getting these huge games where the, it, it becomes unaffordable with flash. You can move over to these mini disc systems where you know, they're pretty inexpensive. And, and so, and again, this is something we're still working on. So, um, but we, we're pretty sure we're going to lock that down. So there'll be some sort of a cutoff. Uh, if it's bigger than X, then it goes onto the mini disc version of the disc. Um, but um, it, it's going to be pretty interesting, I think. So the cartridges in themselves are, what, what are the sizes we're looking at for cartridges? Do you, do you know like uh, yeah we're i'm just gonna go from memory here so you know this isn't written in rock or anything but i want to say that somewhere the cutoff is somewhere around 70 megabytes something like that and then we get up into the you know multiple hundreds uh then that then and, and over that it'll probably go up to the mini disc and the mini discs are like the like mds you're you're talking about like in similar to UMDs in that case? Um, I, they're not going to be similar to that. Um, it, it's going to be an off-the-shelf product um, that will fit, and uh, that's about all I can tell you right now. Okay. Uh, It'll fit in the cartridge, and uh, and I'm, I'm not telling you to be secretive. I'm telling you because I'm not the hardware guy, <laughs> and I, I'm not sure what they're putting in. I've, we, were ju we just started talking about this within the last like two weeks. Um, so they're still kind of edumacating me on it. So I got, I got a quick question. This is, yeah. kind of, it's kind of like a joke question, but yeah. we're already talking about like the limits of the cartridge mm -hmm. and, and the size. Will there ever be the retro CD, like, <laughs> like yeah, right. a retro CD? I, I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't think so. That sits underneath just like the old yeah. Sega CD. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to ask you to give you, give the, uh, the cartridge size in mega power. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, that'd be that'd be uh, tugging at the heartstrings there. I'm probably one of the few crazy people that just still adores the Sega CD to this day. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, uh, again, I, I mean, the accessories that could be brought out on this, um, I think we could be really smart about what we bring out. I think we're, you know, we've got people on the team and on our advisory board that, um, you know, have been in the industry. They've been successful running these big companies, and they're in, they've been in the hardware business. They've been in the software business, and and uh, the, the great thing about this product, even from my standpoint, uh, you know, kind of pulling this team together and, and you know, we're still building a team. Uh, I'm going up to the Bay Area next week to meet with uh, an ex-president uh, of two very large companies who uh, is very intrigued by this idea that uh, we may bring on uh, in, uh, you know, an executive role, which, which will make waves uh, all over the place uh, if, if we bring him on. And so... This is this project has been so great because I mean I grew up, you know I'm I'm in my mid 40s, but a lot of these guys on the team are in their low to mid 50s or late 50s, um, who have you know we have Michael Katz uh, on our advisory board. I'm talking to Howard Phillips about being on the board, and we've got some Exitari uh, arcade guys, Owen Rubin on the board, and and um, you know there's just people that are really intrigued by this at and and the timing of all of this, which everybody is like, timing is perfect for this right now. And, 
and uh, that's kind of always uh, what I've thought. You know, I, uh, we've had this idea for the last couple of years, but it really wasn't until last year's E3 where I kind of saw the industry embracing retro and nostalgia uh, like it is. And, of course, it's continued right on through this E3 in a really big way. I mean, some of the biggest announcements this year were nostalgic-type announcements, you know. So, uh, plus the fact that the indies are being invited into onto the show floor by Microsoft and Nintendo and Sony to show off their their games, many of which are retro Axiom Verge and, and Nidog, and I mean the list goes on and on and on, really. So it's uh, you know this is a genre that's here to stay. It's an art form that is also going to give it the staying power, I think, at this point that that it needs. And we happen to have all these developers that grew up on these games and now run their own studios or work for big studios, and they're making games that they loved playing when they were growing up. And, um, you know, so it's a really great time to be a, a kind of a, a, a gamer of all ages because even young gamers love games like Shovel Knight, games like Retro City Rampage and yeah, and I, um, I tell you, Shantae I tell, and stuff. So I tell you what, if you could get, I don't know, see, this is where it's like a big uh, dark area in terms of who owns the licenses still, mm-hmm. but games like Road Rash 4, yeah. Or Streets of Rage 4 or Vector yeah. Man 3, um, you know, yeah. um, Chacon the Forever Man 2, yeah. or like sequel to these, these, yeah, like a continuation of what the 16 bit, like if Heck it yeah. just kept, if it would have just kept going. Well, that's if, why I'm doing this. That was my original plan, you know, and I think it's really going to take the gamers to support this idea because, I mean, this may be our last chance. I mean, uh, again, getting the, the tooling and not having to spend that money up front. I mean, there's a lot of things have aligned. To, to, to get this product to where it's going to get here in the next couple of months. And, and so I think if developers, and here's the deal, we have connections with all of those companies, yeah you know, and certainly, you know, uh, tracking down old IP, seeing who owns it and all of these types of things. We've got great connections in this business. And so we can exploit that. We can take advantage of that, but we got to show that everybody that there's a massive market here. And I, I'm not talking millions of people, but you know, a few hundred thousand gamers around the world that would love to get some of these games on cartridges, that would love to play a new 16-bit Fantasy Star or a new Streets of Rage. You know, tr- like you said, true 16-bit sequels yeah. um, to some of these games. And I think if 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 this Kickstarter is a booming success, uh, I think that'll give us the ammunition to go out and bring these games to market because this is really the perfect format for them. They wouldn't work well on mobile. They've tried that. You know, there's been some of these games come out on mobile and they're just crap, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, to, to stream them, you know, bring them out in, uh, you know, in the Xbox store, the micro Sony store or whatever. Um, there's been some success there, but, but, you know, they're kind of always overshadowed by the bigger games. So I was like, this is a, this is a platform that those games will i mean i mean they're gonna that's it's all about those games um and so it's it's not like they're gonna get toppled over by all these other crazy you know 3d triple a games that everybody's you know uh it's just a good format for it so again uh we hope that the gamers get behind this and uh because of that then we can kind of flex the muscle that we need to and go out use our contacts to to go to these big developers and say hey there is a market here there are people that still want these games but they don't want a 3d uh remake or what are this or that or you know whatever i mean they want like you know if the genesis wouldn't have died out or the super nes wouldn't have died out it had another two or three years left in it what would these games have been on uh been like that it would have come out on them at that point and uh, and that's really what we want to do. Um, so yeah, that's definitely in the model. And and um, you know we've um, I've, you know Mike Micah uh, at Other Ocean. He's a third party developer that's done lots of work over the last fifteen or twenty years with all of the big publishers: Sega, Konami, Capcom, Namco. I mean, he knows all of them intimately, and has done great work for them over the years. And so he's kind of uh, an end to those people. And to those types of companies for us. Um, and uh, again, this gentleman that I'm meeting with next week could uh, really help us bring some exclusive 16-bit sequel licenses to this thing that uh, I think would blow people's minds, and, and mine included. I mean, I want to play these games. And real real quick, now, um, I know Joe's got probably some more stuff to ask, but when I look at the Genesis and Super Nintendo like combined, okay, we've got limitations on either side. We've got some say the Genesis, well, it's, it's a fact that it had a limited color palette, 
and and some of the games suffered because of the color palette and the yeah. super nintendo had a really slow clock speed so mm-hmm. a lot of times in the shooters would be a lot of slowdown or a yeah. lot of stuff on the screen would get slow down I'm so this any... this this console could potentially yeah. rectify the color palette Definitely. you know provide tons of action on screen so what we're looking at right here is like a combination of the best of the both worlds yeah. and and you see you see this system being able to pump out Say like you take a game like Act Razor 2 on the Super mm-hmm. Nintendo, which mm-hmm. had phenomenal graphics. So this yeah. thing could pump out visuals that look just like that. Lots of parallax yeah. scrolling and all that, yeah. and it no problem running stuff like that. Won't even near the cap. That won't even touch the capability of this thing. Okay, that, that's good to hear. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Why make it if we can't? You know, I mean, here's the deal. When I originally started this thing um, a year ago and kind of really got serious about it, we were talking about. Um, this thing kind of just being a 16-bit system, mm-hmm. um, that's been completely tossed out the, the window now. I mean, we're, you know, it's like we're just taking this thing. It's almost going to be a next-generation system, um, like I said. So it it's going to just have tons of capability. But the beautiful thing is, is that developers that want to be tied to those limitations, because some are challenged by that. Um, and they love that challenge, you know. And so the FPGA component of our system will allow people, if they want to be confound by the Genesis architecture, the SNES architecture, the NES, or the Amiga, or the Commodore, or the S- Atari SD, whatever, um, they can make a game that would run only on those systems. And then it would it's going to port very easily over to our system, and uh, it would be confound to that. Um, but our system has got you know much more capability than that. So, again, it's, it's really going to be up to the you know, the developers to decide how they want to exploit this power. And some may not want to exploit all of the power. Uh, If they want it to look like a specific era game, they can scale it back. You know, if they want to amp it up and make it a SNES game on steroids, they can do that. You know, Um, it's really going to be interesting to see what developers can do with this because it's, uh, it's again. It's it's uh, it's going to cater to the low level languages, the high level languages. We're trying to get this thing to work with Unity. Um, it's going to be OpenGL based. I mean, it's got an ARM and the FPGA system in it, so it's kind of got two different uh, options for developers to exploit. And there's even options where the ARM and the FPGA work hand in hand. Um, it, I'm telling you guys, this is going to be the, the guys I have working on the hardware on this are crazy. Um, they're just nuts and they're, they're getting so, uh, I mean, this thing is just going to be amazing. <laughs> I mean, it really is. I have, I have some questions about that in the sense that what is the operating system going to be like? Is this going to be like, it's, it's, it's not going to be an Android system, right? No. Okay. No, definitely. It's, is it going to be, there, there technically is no, there, there's no Linux. I mean, there, there is no OS in this. Okay. Is there going to be some type of. Um, I'm looking because I'm looking at the FAQ here and what you just said uh-huh. also that like, you know, if you wanted to run a game like it would run on a Neo Geo or for example, it could you could do that on the retro VGS. But is is it actually doing something like emulating a Neo Geo environment or is it just giving you a Neo Geo like environment? Yeah, well, the FPGA hardware emulates that system. Um, it doesn't software them. It, it basically recreates the original hardware that those games were running on. And so new games that are built to run on that original hardware will run exactly as they would on that original hardware on our system. So the, the, the caveat there is there's got to be a, a core, which is you know an FPGA core, written for that particular console. So, um, like, for example, right now, there is not a Super NES core uh, at least one that, you know, is is tried and true, super high quality, down to the Nats ass of SNES. Uh, there are people working on it. We're working with Kevin Horton, uh, Keptris. Uh, he's sort of one of the premier FPGA experts in the country. Um, well, in the world, probably. Um, and uh, he's already developed lots of cores. Um, and so we're going to license cores from Kevin. You know, you've got the Mist board out there. Those guys have basically recreated a lot of the uh, 8-bit PC cores. Um, so those are out there. And we don't want to go out and steal these cores from people and everything else. So we're, you know, we really want to go by the book. We want to license these cores from the people that made them. Um, and, uh, and essentially in the cartridge, we mate that 
that code, um, you know, of that game with the particular core or system that that game was made for. And when we insert that cartridge into our slot, it's going to tell the FPGA in our system, you now have to become an Amiga or a Neo Geo or a Genesis or an Atari or an Intellivision or a ColecoVision or whatever. So would those cores um, configure the system to use be used exactly like a Genesis? Or, for example, if you wanted yeah. to make a Genesis game using the Genesis programming environment, but you mm -hmm. wanted to mm -hmm. make, you, you know, you wanted to utilize more RAM or more mm -hmm. speed um, that mm -hmm. the Genesis didn't normally have, would you be able to do that? That's a really good question. I, I believe so. Um, I think they're limited to the palettes and the, par you know, whatever. Um, but, I mean, I, I'm not sure if size is a limitation when it comes to the FPGA? That's a really good question. See, I think the, I think because that's important for the question that Josh had asked earlier in that, you know, there is, you know, for example, slowdown in shooters and things on the yeah. Super Nintendo or whatever, but, or the limited color palette on the I, Genesis. I don't think that that type, I don't think that's going to translate through this thing. Um, but I, I, I will ask. Because that's a that's a, one of the things I was wondering was that like, you know, because, you know, what happened with, the Super Nintendo or the Genesis or, or something, the reason you they went on to more systems is because you had yeah. reached the kind of limitation. Yeah. Whereas yeah, if, right. with this, if you could use that same environment, but, you know, get rid of some of those limitations, the kind of yeah. new style of 16-bit games that you could make yeah. or the new... Yeah. Well, I think the answer is, is yes. I mean, but, I mean, you got games like Shovel Knight. I mean, that game you could not play on an NES. You know, it's just too big. Um, it looks like an NES game, sort of. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, definitely those, uh, I, I think that, that the system will, will be able to do that. No problem. Even if they're made through that FPGA system. And, you know, if it's, um, that's a good question. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask it, but I, I, I don't think we're going to have the, the issues with it. I think size wise and slowdown, I think a lot of that will be gone uh, just because of the architecture of it. But some of the stuff they will still be held to. I mean, you know, whatever the color palette was of the Genesis and you're making a Genesis game with that, you got to stick to that color palette. Yeah, I I, you know. I was just thinking that you know if if the slowdown isn't there even with the li even with a limited Genesis color mm -hmm. palette like mm -hmm. if you could you could kind of you know get beyond the the RAM limitations or something you could still yeah. make a much better Genesis yeah. game than you would be possible on an actual Genesis even if it's in the yeah. same style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I'm pretty sure that the answer is that that is the case on this that you would be able to do that but i'm going to double check and there were a few games on the genesis where they did something inside of the cartridge where they were able to bypass i think eternal champions and ranger x were both able to to use more colors on screen um, than the original 64 allowed from the genesis they tricked it out tricked yeah. Them out somehow yeah, yeah 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 well that's the thing i mean developers learn how to cut corners and they learn you know as they as, as they make more games for a particular system it's kind of vulnerabilities are, are figured out and then people figure out a way to bypass them and i mean that's the way it was clear back every to the atari for god's sake i mean yeah. you had activision doing things on the atari that atari never dreamed of um so yeah i think uh, i think i think we're going to be okay on uh, more on the hardware output uh is there going <laughs> to be any other options besides HDMI? Like, would I be able to hook this up to my CRT TV? Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So there is there going to be like a like a SCART output or an RGB output or? Oh, we talked about SCART. Um, I guess mainly for Europe, I think. Um, I thought, but we've kind of discounted that. But um, but it's going to have a composite um, and HD and S video, I believe. Okay. So S S video that's that's good enough I think it not because I'm I'm in Japan and uh, oh we have know that. we have the uh, yeah that's why that's why you're mentioning SCART I got you okay well I'm in Japan and we use D terminal it's like something totally oh, okay. different but um, I'm assuming that you know S video is a pretty big standard in Japan back mm -hmm. in the you know 80s and 90s and, yeah. and there's yeah. there's a D terminal now which is like allows up to 1080i i believe um mm -hmm. through a uh, non non hd hdmi cable i guess it's it's a mm -hmm. looks like a computer plug almost but yeah, uh yeah. then there's also you know just standard rgb and yeah there's a, there's a lot of options and i think like as people who are into retro games kind of mm -hmm. 
feel strongly about not having their retro. I mean, it was a big right. thing when the Retron Five came out that like yeah. only HDMI was an option, and I think people yeah. really didn't like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it won't be the only option. Okay, that's uh, that's actually probably uh, good to hear. I think people will be happy to hear yeah. that. Yeah, definitely. Now, um, are you guys the, the Kickstarter is is coming soon? Are you guys going to have? I, m- I remember hearing the original date was going to be uh, this summer. Are you guys still looking somewhere in July uh, or August? I am still. It's definitely not going to be July. Definitely um, not July. But I'm hold. I'm I'm remaining hopeful that it will be in August. Okay. Um, you know we're you know we want to have a prototype, um, uh, or at least a a simulated environment. We're actually uh, going to be purchasing an evaluation board. Um, pretty soon from our process man, our processor manufacturer that'll essentially simulate this thing, um, simulate our environment pretty well. So, um, and then our plan is to get these boards in the hands of a couple of uh, our bigger name announce, uh, bigger game uh, announcements that, that, that are coming to the developers to get their game running on that board. And then uh, that will be probably kind of the proof of concept that we'll go to Kickstarter with. Okay. And then uh, once this thing's funded, I mean, this thing's going to go through a variety, you know, various levels of prototypes. You know, typically with a consumer product, you could have, you know, up to, you know, seven to ten prototypes before you actually get to the factory build, you know. Um, so, you yeah, know, we're taking this really seriously. And uh, I got people that have done this in the past and they know the, you know, the challenges with bringing a consumer electronics product to market. And and um, I think it's in good hands. But still hope, hopeful that it'll be August. That's good to hear. Yeah. And then the Kickstarter. So would you say just a ballpark figure that it could be possible that people will actually have this in their homes and say maybe under under a year and a half's time, two years time? Yeah. Oh, I sure hope so. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm sort of figuring, to, you know, we'll probably, I mean, hopefully we'd be, we'd be delivering within a year of the end of the Kickstarter. So second or third quarter. Okay. Of next year. That's a, that's a good turnaround time. I think... Uh... Yeah, I think it's a probably faster than people were expecting. Uh, really? Yeah, I mean, we you don't want to wait two three years. I, I can't remember how long it took Uya to kind of get get out. Um, but uh, you know, we're pretty we're a lot different than than what they're doing. I mean, they had a lot of infrastructure they had to build in advance, and and of course, it never really worked that great. Um, and a lot of things they had to do up front um, that we don't have to because of. You know, our system's going to be, uh, you know, in a sense, much simpler. Um, and we're making this in the USA. Um, this thing's going to be made under our own roof. Uh, the PCBs may be made in China, um, but I'm not completely sure that that's going to be the case. I mean, I really, we, we want to make sure the majority of it's made here in the in the country um, under our roof so we have total control over as much of the process as, as possible. Um you know, so whether the PCB is contract manufactured in China or in the States, that's kind of an up in the air question. Kind of comes down to cost a little bit. But uh, if it's not much more, we'd, we'd love to just do it locally. And, and we're in California, so we got lots of resources out here. Um, and uh, yeah, so and we want to be very transparent. I mean, we're being very unprofessional and uh, and it's sort of by design. I mean, we're really wanting to get people vested in this and we're, we're learning a lot from people and we're learning what's important to people and we're trying to make changes if and when we can and when it, it makes sense. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, there's a lot of positive vibes. It's just great. And it, it, it keeps motivating us to keep making this the coolest product that, that it can all, that, that it can be. And, uh, you know, the Facebook group, is super active. It's unbelievable. I mean, we post a question or a new piece of news, and I mean, there's five or six thousand views within a couple of days, and there's you know hundreds of you know hundred comments or more, and and uh, people are just really uh, interested in this thing, and and um, and we want to make a game that we want to play. I mean, I know that's what everybody says, a system that we want to play. I mean, Steve Weida wants to make a game system that he wants to that he can make games for again. Um, I mean, he did Kid Chameleon, he did Sonic Spinball, he did Sonic 2, he did a lot of the Tengen NES games. Um, you know, he wants to make games for this thing again and uh, make a system that he can make games for again. So it's, um, so know, we're it, all really passionate about this. Is there a possibility we could see a Kid Chameleon 2 on the retro? Potentially, yeah. Uh, I think it's still a Sega-owned product, but um, again, 
just a little hint, the, the person that I'm talking to next week may uh, may be able to make it happen. Let's see. Wow. I, I have a question about uh, how would you respond to somebody who uh, who said like, um, I'm I'm skeptical of this because I think it's just going to be a bunch of eight and sixteen bit indie games that I can download yeah. on Steam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, all I'm going to say is it's not going to be that. Um, I mean, that's the, that's not the point of this whole thing. Um, you know, I mean, would you love to play Retro City Rampage on cartridge? I know that's a game that's already been out. That's not really, I mean, you know, that would be a great... Some games are meant to be preserved. That's really the, the bottom line. And some aren't. And we want to really make sure that we are smart about the games that we bring to this thing, that they're games that people want to play years down the road. They want to collect. They want to own it. They want to put it on their wall. Um, you know, we don't want this thing just to be a box of Flash and, and Android mobile style games that were just brought, um, you know. Um, but, but, I mean, frankly, there are some really great mobile games that have come out over the last five, five to seven years that are gone and forgotten about that were, you know, hugely successful titles when they came out. That would be great to bring back on this thing if it if the if the developer the the porting costs were next to nothing and it could remonetize and, and breathe new life into those games and it's like oh wow you know uh, Super Mega Worm I loved this game three or four years ago um, here's a cartridge with all of the Super Mega Worm games on it and uh, on, in HD you know with a proper controller multiplayer it'd be awesome and and there's just so many games that are like that so. Um, we want to bring big games to this thing. That's why, you know, we're talking to Ron Gilbert and 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 uh, to Yacht Club and to Brian and, and you know, uh, potentially, the you know, Mighty Number no. 9 group. You know, I was supposed to go to the Too Many Games Festival. Um, I guess it's this was, shoot, is it this weekend already? I think it's this weekend. Yeah, it's yeah. this weekend. Yeah, they invited me up there. They're really excited about this thing and they want to help us promote it, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, all the YouTube channels that they preside over. I mean, they, they you know, you know, I mean, they, they preside over Angry Video Game Nerd and, and a whole bunch of game grumps and big ones. And um, and so, uh, but yeah, we, we want to have games that are, um, that people want to buy, that they want to collect, they want to play years down the road, that are big enough that, uh, you know, it's like it's a, it's a 99, it's not a 99. It, these aren't going to be 99 cent games. And going off, that's the point. Going off of Joe's question, uh, yeah. I had, uh, I think I wanted to ask, okay, now Joe asked like the 16 bit and the, the retro style games, how important in your strategy in getting this thing out there and, and generating interest is it to have games that are exclusive to your console where, mm -hmm. yeah, it'd be great to have Shovel Knight on a cart and it'd be great mm -hmm. to have Retro City Rampage and all that, yeah. but how important is it for you to have games that you can't get anywhere, anywhere else? else? Well, I mean, obviously that uh, that would be that would be massive if we could get it. Now, the deal is, at least initially, I don't want to go to a developer and demand exclusivity if we only have 5,000 people buy this thing and limit them and their ability to, to go out and monetize and sell a variety of SKUs to a variety of consoles. I mean, I don't want to, I want to help developers, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to limit them. But, um, you know, it would be great to get an exclusive on some of these games, especially if they were a console seller, you know, Streets of Rage or a new Ghosts and Goblins or, you know, new Bomberman or something like that. Um, you know, again, I think if we can get the right team together, that, that those types of opportunities uh, may present themselves here, um, which would be huge. But as far as, you know, some of these other really great indie titles that are coming out. I mean, unless I've got, you know, unless we've got a massive market, you know, 50 to 100,000 people that want to buy this game, I don't want to lock them into an exclusive contract. Now, we may lock them into a six-month exclusive, right, where we get it for the first six months. I mean, that's a pretty common practice in the industry these days. Um, but what I can say is we will probably have the cartridge exclusive. So, you know, if you're not a digital guy, you want to own and collect the games and, and enjoy them for years down the road on the original hardware, this is going to be your only option, regardless if it's exclusive or not. Uh, it is going to be a cartridge exclusive. Okay, yeah. do, you, do you have, um, maybe it's a little early to say an actual studio, but do you have a group of guys that are making games just exclusively for this no. system? Okay. Not yet, no. Okay. Do you plan on finding, I mean, because you're saying like you're working with people who used to make games, do you think they would make games for it exclusively? 
oh, well, I mean, we've, you know, our whole plan was originally to have a first party dev team that was made up of a lot of these ex, you know, iconic game developers that we all know. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't rule that out. Um, that potentially could happen now it may not happen before the kickstarter but it could happen before we start delivering next year do you have a uh do you have a pack-in game yeah 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 well we're using we're packing in um there's one game for sure uh, adventures of tiny night which is collector visions doing and um it's going to be a pretty cool game and um you know, but I'm talking to NG Dev Team about packing in Gunlord. I'm talking to there may be a second pack in for Kickstarter people, and uh, the, the way the Kickstarter is going to happen and work is that we want to launch this thing with somewhere between. I keep edging it up because I keep adding games to the list. Uh, probably, ultimately, we we'll probably have around 25 games that are going to be part of this Kickstarter. So, depending on what bundle you buy, you'll be able to pick out two of the available games, or three of the available games, or five of the available games, and add them to your bundle. Um, so, they're not really a pack-in, but uh, Tiny Knight is a pack-in. I mean, that's coming with every console. That will be the first. That'll be at least for the, for the first year of production, the retail pack-in. Um, but for Kickstarter, you know, we may throw in a second uh, title that that's that everybody's going to get. Um, that's maybe a maybe a bit you know maybe a more well-known title or license or franchise of some sort at some level um so you kind of get one brand new original title and you get one that that you know you've heard of or maybe as a port or you know something like that the great thing about like ng dev team is i mean their games are typically four five six hundred dollars right if you're familiar with their games the their uh, neo geo aes games um and so oh you know if we can take a game like gun lord that was like a four or five i can't what was a five or six hundred dollar cartridge when you traded in an aes game and everything else it ended up being for 50 bucks that's pretty compelling yeah. you know? now, have, has the interest in people that you've talked to that are willing to work on the system and produce content for it mm-hmm. Has the interest that they've shown been primarily sprite-based games? Have there also been people interested in making, like, 3D polygon? Because you said that the system could potentially, mm-hmm. like, up to PS2 level. Yeah, yeah. Has there been a lot of interest? I, in- you know, most of the interest are the sprite-based games. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, again, it'll have the capability to go above and beyond that. But, you know, personally for me, that's sort of the sweet spot. Those are the games that I want to play. Um you know, I want to play the the 2D fighters, the 2D shooters, the 2D platformers. The you know, that's that's really what I want to play. And the the, the good thing about like you said the the PlayStation 2 level was good because that was an interesting time in gaming as to where we had gotten past the really ugly kind of jaggy graphics of yeah. the PS1, and yep. we had, we had solved a 3D space problem where yeah. you could actually control games in 3D and it, it was yeah. fully functional. Games like Maximo and yeah. you know, uh, other types of games where yeah. it was a 3D environment and it was polygons, mm-hmm. but it was easy to control. And it yep. was and it was and this was before the time of releasing games that had to have patches. You know, most yeah. most games on the PS2 were released and they were, they were pretty solid. So even going back to something like that yeah. would yeah. still be I, a lot of fun. Heck yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, whatever developers want to bring, you know, I mean, the, 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 the capability will be there for that. And uh, speaking of Maximo, I mean, we know David Siller and, and uh, we're you know, been trying to rally a conversation with David. Um, he did that. He also did Arrow the Acrobat kind of much before that and uh, worked for Sunsoft and did a couple other platformers for them. And, and he's kind of been out of the industry for a little bit. But, um, you know, we're kind of hoping to jump into a conversation with him pretty soon that, that could be kind of interesting. And Yeah, that's what I'm excited to hear. More more so than anything is is hearing that you're in talks with all these developers that, that you know, Kid Chameleon and yeah. you, know, you said Maximo, like hearing, seeing these guys, you know, get back to work again and, yeah. and stuff. Oh, I mean, we've talked to John and Brenda Romero. I mean, they're friends. Um, you know, I mean, this really goes on and on. <laughs> I mean, it's it really does. So, I mean, it... If the demand is there, um, I think we can get some pretty incredible games onto this thing from, from you know, new and original games to games that people have just been praying to see come back to life for 10 or 15 years. Um, and, uh, you know, some potentially with the original develop, development teams and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's going to be really great. And, you know, we've also got the, the media component that, that's really interesting. 
Um, we've got Retro Magazine, which I launched a couple years ago. So we're now printing 40,000 of those. They're pretty much all going into circulation. We're in Barnes & Noble. we got subscribers in 35 countries. Um, we're really going to, you know, the, the reason we call it the Retro VGS is, is because we're tying into the retro brand that we launched a couple years ago with the magazine. So, you know, it sounds like a stupid generic name, I think, to a lot of people. But when they kind of see the whole picture with the magazine, which has got a pretty identifiable logo and brand that's starting to build behind it, I think the combination of that that built in media mechanism that we can use to promote our own products, um, not review our own products, but, you know, have developer interviews and previews of games that are coming up kind of like. You know, sort of like Nintendo Power and, and the Nintendo products. Uh, we'll probably add six to ten or eight to ten pages or whatever of content. Um, in addition to our eighty-page magazine already, we're not going to uh, we're not going to eliminate pages and dedicate it to. It. We're going to add pages to it, so uh, it'll still be it'll still be getting the full retro magazine, but we'll have maybe up to ten pages dedicated to talking about discussing the games and the, and the console and the games that are coming out for it and using that as a mechanism to promote indies, you know, indie gamers and their games, give them some coverage, you know, in a print magazine. Uh, it's also digital, but um, so I think it, hand in hand, it, it's going to be a pretty compelling model. And, um, and again, you, you know, you're going to get a subscription to the magazine when you buy the product and, and it's all going to fit together. Yeah. That's one of the things I was, um, I was a bit hesitant on was was the name like retro because mm-hmm. the name yeah. the word retro has such a broad term and yeah. and the and the word retro gets tossed around so much yep. these days where all of a sudden today like playing you know playing a two D game back in nineteen ninety five was the most uncool thing you could do like the world yeah. had moved on yeah. and it seems like nowadays everybody is retro everything retro is yeah. cool and yeah. you know to to see a powerful name like I always use like the Dreamcast <clears throat> excuse me as an example. The, the Dreamcast was such like a the name evoked these thoughts in your head like what is a Dreamcast? It, to me yeah. that was such a, a powerful name like yeah. starting a new console and calling it retro as opposed to yeah. like picking out like a really cool name. But yeah, you no. Know, when you, hearing you explain it, you know it's it's kind of like your brand. You know you got the magazine, this the console, and it makes sense from you know listening to what you just said there. You know yeah yeah. Well, I, I did a podcast, Retro Gaming Roundup. We started that back in two thousand eight. It's like a six to eight hour monthly show, and we've never missed a month in what eight nine ten eleven twelve in seven years um and so you know retro and me go way back i mean you know at least to 2008 okay. and then uh, you know i started game gavel which is like ebay for video games and trying to give you know gamers a better cheaper place to buy and sell their games and and that's kind of been a struggle to keep going but to this date it's still the only dedicated gaming auction site in the world and uh, I think now because of the success of the magazine, and we're going to start putting full page ads, you know, for Game Gavel in the magazine. We, we may do a rebrand and a relaunch um, of that to, again, tie it more into the retro brand. So we've got the marketplace where people can buy and sell. We've got the console over here. We've got the magazine. Um, you know, it's, it's starting to kind of be this network of, uh, of products and sites that uh, I'm pretty proud of. And, and, and uh, they're pretty unique. I mean, there's nothing really out there like any of them and yeah. combined it, it's i think it's uh, the sum of the parts is more than the individual pieces i think and and uh i think it's all going to play very well together and uh but uh yeah yeah but it's a good you know other people have mentioned that but i think again when they kind of hear it and they can understand why we're doing it it sort of makes sense and because i love the retro logo i don't know if you've seen our magazine but i mean it's a it's a really vibrant simple but it stands out um, and I just think we're, you know, we're going to use the same logo on the consoles we are on the magazine. So that's cool. Yeah. The, the magazine kind of gave off like a, kind of like a diehard game fan kind of vibe to it, you yeah. know, with the, the quality and the color pictures and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. and we've got, you know, the writing team we've got, we've got Jeremy and, and Chris Kohler and Jeremy Parrish and Sean baby and Andy Eddie. And, and I mean, this great cast of writers, um, Cat Bailey, Alex Hall is our copy editor, and and it's just an all star cast, and they've got lots of influence and reach into the industry, and and um, you know I don't want them to promote this product if they think it's a crappy product and they don't really believe that this is really cool. So you know, I, but I think ultimately um, if they love it and they and they see what we're doing is really cool, I hope that they'll promote it uh, through their networks and channels, and of course they've got hundreds of thousands of people combined that they kind of you know whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or whatever. Um, you know, I think we're just going to get lots of support, um, 
when it comes out. And I think we're going to get tons of free press, too. It's already started. I mean, it's been talked about in about every country there is and in every language there is. And, and um, I think because of the, the Jaguar component, the, the fact that it's a cartridge-based system to play new games on cartridges, the first kind of console cartridge-based system since the N64, I mean, that's newsworthy. I think when people start seeing who is on this team and who we're bringing together, that's going to be newsworthy. I mean, this thing really, um, it's just going to be interesting to see where it goes. You know, I mean, it's really going to be a fascinating 45-day uh, campaign for anybody that's kind of interested in just watching this from the sidelines and, and seeing what happens. Because, I mean, we really don't know what to expect. I mean, we're getting lots of great feedback. We're getting lots of criticism. We're, you know, people, there's people that – there's not a lot of in-between. It's like this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Who in the hell is going to make games for this? Who in the hell is going to buy this system? And then we got, you know, all these people on the other ones going, my God, this is the most important system that's come out in years. You know, this could change the course of the industry, you know, maybe at a, an extreme level. Right. Yeah. Um, so and, and there's not a lot of in between. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see what wins out, you know. And hey, if we fund, you know, the great thing about Kickstarter is if it is an idea that's too far gone, people don't buy it. OK, but it is what it is. You know, we'll keep the magazine going and uh, it's growing like crazy. And and that's great. Um but um, again, I think this is probably going to be one of the last opportunities to, to keep this type of, uh, you know, technology around to to kind of bring that culture back that a lot of us grew up on. I mean, there's gaming culture today and then there's the gaming culture that that, you know, we kind of grew up on. Right. Yeah. And um, there's some good, good, good parts of that culture that have, that are disappearing uh, with every new console generation. You know, um, I always say, you know, what are what are kids going to do? brag about and put on their walls and when they're you know out of school and in work and they're going to go to ebay and what are they going to buy yeah. you know there's just not going to be a whole lot left there pretty soon and so you know i just think uh, and again it may be a, a, a stupid corny thing to say uh, who says corny anymore um that's how retro i am but <laughs> but I, I you know i think about stuff like that you know and i've talked to young kids um you know in their te mid to late teens and and they're not happy about first day patches and they're not happy about you know sequel boxes sequel 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 um you know they want tangibility they want to own something i mean look at skylanders and infinity and amiibo i mean people want to hold on to something they want to collect something yeah you know and the ultimate thing to collect is a magical piece of plastic with a game on it you know uh, at least in my book, that's sort of the the pinnacle of something to collect. And, uh, you know, at least for retro gamers, um, here's an outlet for that, uh, hopefully for years to come, where they can buy, sell, collect, trade, whatever they want to do with their friends, um, you know, give them that ability to, to do that again. Okay, so you said uh, for the pack-in game, uh, Tiny Knight, that's, that's for sure, that's a given. Yep, yep. Okay, is that game close to being completed, or is it still? Uh, it's getting close. Um, not to being completed, but uh, I, they're, uh, that's um, John Game Straight E1 and Collector Vision. They're, uh, they've got the game on Expo coming out here uh, next month, uh, well, in August. And they do want to have a playable demo of that game. Um, we're not sure um, you know, how much of the game will be playable, but, I mean, I've played it. I mean, I, they've, there, there's, a, there's a level demo out right now. Uh, for us and uh, you know it's been really great so um, they want to have a playable demo of that and we're hoping that we'll have a system that, that'll be able to play that potentially in August um, it may be a prototype board you know not the finished product of course but something that uh, you know you can hook the controller up to and play on the on the on the screen so okay um, now would, would so, you say I, I haven't checked out uh, the tiny night yet uh, now as many people that's that's gonna be their first experience with the console it sounds mm -hmm. like um, would you describe, from what you've seen of that game, would you describe that as like the second coming of 16-bit in terms of graphics and? and um, I, I, you know, again, it's a it's a 16-bit style game. Uh, it's kind of uh, been influenced by uh, the Wonder Boy series. It's kind of a, a platforming RPG. Uh -huh. uh, it's it's kind of got a great story. It's got some great gameplay elements. Um, but I mean, it's it's. It's not the killer app uh, of our system, if that's what you're asking. And I don't know what the killer app is. I think the killer app is we're bringing games back onto cartridges again. And, and we're giving developers the ability to bring any style a game that they want onto cartridge for the most part. You know, as long you know, but as long as anything but some big AAA, you know, bazil, you know, 
huge budget game. So know? I'm not going to be able to pop in Arkham Knight and wait an hour and a half for the install to be finished? Yeah, I don't think play? so. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. But um, how cool would it be to bring a game like that onto a cartridge, though? I mean, that would be pretty cool. But um, we're hoping for, you know, Mighty Number no. 9. And, um, you know, we got the new uh, like the Castlevania game that just is getting kickstarted. And, and um, you know, those would be really cool games to be able to bring out on cartridge, I think. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're I'm not saying we can do that yet. I mean, that's what we're, we're we keep stretching the boundaries of what this thing can do. And, um, you know, that is something that would really make this compelling if it could play some of these games that are only available via digital on these on the on the trip, you know, on the big systems. I oh, yeah. Really, yeah. Theoretically, really cool. theoretically speaking, if there was a new Contra or Castlevania yeah. or a series like that, that's been around that people really I mean, that could that could be a game changer for sure. I'm sure it's yeah. probably a nightmare of cost and licenses to get. I tell you like what, some of these titles are ripe for the picking and very inexpensive. I mean, look at all the Data East titles that uh, have now just changed hands for the second time. Um, I mean, shit, those titles haven't been touched for years. Oh, um, Karnov, and, Karnov and Breakthrough, uh, I would love to see. Uh, it's insane. I mean, they they got a hundred to one to two hundred games there. And there's probably 50 of them on people's like list of please bring it back. And these are these are licenses I think we can legitimately go after and pretty much get for next to nothing. I mean, you know, we got to pay them royalties, but you can get the, the license for next to nothing. And because of hell, it they haven't monetized a thing in 20, 30 years in some cases. So you know, it's like hey, here's an opportunity. We'll pay you you know X percent. Um, we're going to manufacture the cartridges and everything else, and uh, we want to bring this game back. And I mean, there's the list of games that people want, I mean, it's almost limitless at this point. I mean, there's a few hundred or, I mean, a few, th- I mean, maybe a, a thousand or more that that people would love to see brought back. So, um, you know, those are going to be titles that we want to go after. Um, I mean, we posed the question on our Facebook page. I mean, you know, we posted, da- you know, what Data East game would you want to see brought back? And, I mean, in, in like less than 10 hours, we had like 150 comments, um, uh, you know, just all of these games that people want to, that would, they'd love to see brought back. And that's just with Data East. And then you look at all of the Capcom and the Konami and then the Namco and the, and then you, you know, some of these other smaller game companies that have just disappeared. Yeah. You know, there's a handful of those types of games that people would love to see brought back. So uh, this is the opportunity to do it. This is the format and the, the system to do it on. And, and um, you know, that's, I mean, that's my goal is to bring those types of games in addition to, you know, tons of brand new IP and games developed by hopefully a whole new, um, you know, market of indie game developers that, that see this as a way to actually make some money. Because, I mean, nobody's making money in mobile anymore. You know, it's saturated, and uh, even if you got a great game, you, you can't get you can't get it out there. And and so, you know, if people want to bring their game onto this thing and and make maybe ten or fifteen or twenty dollars on every cartridge that we sell versus ninety nine cents or some free to play game where they're getting a nickel a click or some crazy thing or whatever, I mean, this is going to be a great opportunity um, for developers, I think, to to make some some money again. And uh, it's up to us to you know not let the you know, the saturation happen and, and everything like that. Unless there's just a ton of great games coming through the channels um, that, um, you know, we, we want to be able to pick the best from the best. Okay. And and we hope that there's enough games coming across our, our front door that want to be brought onto the developers, you know, that where we can pick and choose and just bring out the cream of the crop. Do you have yeah. any major third-party developers lined up? Anything like... Um, I don't know, peep, you would imagine like, you know, say, Sega, for example, has a ton of old stuff. Do you think yeah. um, you could, you would be able to convince Sega to put two guys on making a 16-bit game again or something? I, I truly believe that we can. And I mean, we know people at Sega and this person I'm working with next week, um, uh, you know, uh, had some major influence over Sega uh, not that long ago. Um, and it still has got great connections there, uh, as well as with publishers and developers all over the world, big names. Um, so again, it's just it's just bringing the right people, uh, getting the right people involved, and and so far I think we're going to be able to do that. I think when when the Kickstarter happens, you know our small team of three, <laughs> 
me and my two hardware guys is going to grow probably by two or three more people, plus probably five to seven people on the advisory board that are all big name people that really believe in this project uh, and that are super well connected. Um, you know, uh, I, I think it's, I think it's, I, I mean, we're setting this up so it can't fail, at least in my mind, whether it's the, you know, with the team, the product, hopefully the games, you know, you know, that's a, another thing that uh, if anything will delay the, the, the Kickstarter, it will be the games. You know, we want to launch this thing with some titles. Um, I'd love to get, you know, a title from one of the big four or five developers at launch, but it may not happen. But I think ultimately it will. And I think, you know, going to that next level, you know, I think uh, I think Shovel Knight is, a, is something that we'll, we, we'll, we will get. I think we will get Retro City Rampage. Uh, Pure Solar, you know, Watermelon's all on board for this thing. We're getting ready to announce that. Uh, Pure Solar HD on cartridge. Um, you know, NG Dev Team, uh, they got lots of great games that, for the most part, um, are, are, have only been purchased by a select few people that are Neo Geo fans that have the money to buy, you know, five or $600 game. And we're going to bring the cost of their games uh, down to a level that everybody can afford. Um, and so, um, you know, I'm hoping to, that Ron puts Thimbleweed Park on this. That would be unbelievable. Um, and um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I know I'm just throwing hmm. in a lot of name dropping, but, I mean, we do know these people, you so know. I'm wondering and, uh, so what think, kind of... Uh development environment are we looking at here i mean you said that there's not really an operating system but yeah is it's gonna be open gl but essentially um every uh console is gonna be a dev kit right out of the box there's no additional charge for somebody to make a game for this thing um you're gonna you know we're gonna have development usb ports coming out of the back of this thing uh we will have some uh downloadable software free downloadable software for developers to tie into but they're, they're certainly free to create their own engines their own um, cores. Um, we will have a native core running on this thing in addition to the FPGA cores that will be kind of our maximum kind of envelope of, of uh, specifications. Um, and, and so I know we're vague on this right now, but I really hope that we can get some solid developer information out to them and address these types of things in the next two weeks. Is there and something... I know I've said that on on every interview I've done, but we're really getting to that point now. I mean, we finally locked down the hardware. I mean, you know, that, that really was step one was locking down what's inside this thing, what's under the hood. And now that we've done that, you know, I mean, we, we've still got, it's massive work. I mean, we got, you know, we're working on the circuitry, the board layout and the circuitry. And, and I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Um, so it's just taken a while, but in the scheme of a new product development uh, schedule, I mean, we're doing this in lightning speed. Um, you know, we've been working on it for about a year, which is really fast. Um, and, uh, but yeah, the next step is, is we really need to start getting developers solid information, um, above and beyond the FPGA. Cause that's pretty simple, but that really focuses on the home brewers, the guys that are making Genesis games or SNES games or NES games or whatever. Um, but for the, the, uh, you know, the unity developers and, um, you know, some of these other, uh, game maker and I mean all these other things you know the OpenGL how does this all work and and what uh, BIOS and what system do we have and what tools are we giving developers and all of that stuff it's all stuff we got to address here very very soon. It was wondering about that because um, unlike unlike the kind of homebrew developers I'm thinking about would would there be support for you know popular maker studios like you have know, like game maker and mm -hmm. rpg maker and those those types of things unity is another uh, yeah. popular one that's yeah. kind of yeah. allows lower lower level kind of things i'm not saying like um you know some like huge engine or anything but um, some something like you know the pop popular makers that people use that are you know not exactly like your your high level engines like RPG Maker or something. Um, there's there's yeah. a plenty of those in in Japan that are Japanese only yeah. for kind of uh, indie developers to use. How how would you go about supporting? Well, we're talking kind of to um, there's a couple of engines that we're actually looking at licensing and kind of turning them into our engine that basically um you know it's a kind of a it's almost like um we, we will have a proprietary engine that is sort of the a default engine for 
for developers. But, you know, we're trying to make this work with everything that it, that it can possibly work with. You know, Unity has been a stretch. We've talked to them. You know, we, we got to basically have somebody create a Unity plugin for this thing. You know, there isn't one right now. You know, so again, once we know what our architecture is and it's nailed down, we got to find somebody to make a plug in for Unity. Um, and we've uh, found somebody that, that has got the capability of doing it once we're ready to cut them loose. But again, that's something we don't really want to we don't want to spend money until we know it's funded. You know what I mean? So uh, some of this stuff is just sort of been uh, we know we can do it. There's a cost involved with it. And we're not prepared to, to spend that and get that type of stuff in motion until we know that this thing is going to be funded. Um, but, you know, we're, we're confident that it's going to work with unity. And, um, um, you know, a lot of the guys that, that are, are, you know, people, game developers that are still programming in the lower level, you know, assembly CC plus, it's going to work great with that, you know, through an open GL environment. Um, and, um, but, uh, yeah, there's still some questions to be answered there. But we want to make this thing very easy to make games on. I mean, that's the goal. And 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 Steve and and John, my two guys. I mean, that is the ultimate goal. So you know, I think we we, we will ultimately in the end, I think we will we will do that. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions, Josh. I think I'm out at this point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I think that's it for me too. I think we've got a pretty good idea of. Of what to look forward to, and you know, I, I've asked some questions that I wanted to to hear answers to, and mm -hmm. well, obviously everything's not set in stone, and you know. Yeah, I'd say just keep watching the Facebook page. That's where we tend to make most of our, you know, kind of earth-shattering, groundbreaking new announcements, um, uh, and the fact page, um, and uh, we will be adding some new games uh, announcements here, hopefully within the next week. Um, as I mentioned, we're, you know, we're going to be announcing uh, Pierce Solar. Uh, Watermelon's also just finishing up a really nice 2D fighter that's really going to be great um, that we're going to bring onto this thing. Um, there's, uh, uh, like I said, we want to have probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 games announced with a Kickstarter. But before this product launches in a year and actually delivers, I, I you know, if this Kickstarter does what we think it's going to do, uh, I think we could have certainly um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 100 launch titles for this thing. I know it sounds crazy, but I mean, every day we got developers beating down our door, and, and and you know some of them are games that don't look that great, but a lot of them are really nice looking games. And so you know a lot of that's got to get kind of fleshed out. But uh, I think that the the developers are going to see an outlet here to finally start generating some revenue again. And uh, if that's the case and we treat them right, which we fully intend to, we want to really make this a, a great uh, opportunity for, for a variety of developers um, to bring their games onto this thing. Um, and, you know, uh, um, if we have 25 available at the Kickstarter launch a year from now, there could be another 50, 75 games in addition to that. So uh, it could be kind of interesting to see. And, and maybe we can bring back some of these sequels for the actual launch launch of it. But how cool would it be to have stretch goals for some of these big games, right? Um, and actually kickstart these games right alongside the console. Um, and uh, I, I would say, you know, we've, we've only got a, maybe a month, month and a half to put those types of deals together. But it's something that we're pursuing. Okay. And now, one, one more quick question that I just brought up. Um, do you see turning to Kickstarter often to get the bigger games, uh, like to gauge interest, or is that something you just want to hit people with announcements that it's already started or it's already begun, or do you see yourself having to go to Kickstarter for some of the bigger games? Well, I mean, developers might, um, and at this point, unless we become a first party, to, you know, our own development house, which we potentially would use at that at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, for right now, the games that are going to be uh, announced along with the Kickstarter. The thing is, like, when the OUYA launched, they didn't have to announce any games. I mean, it was Android-based. They knew there was going to be games. You know, yeah, they tried to get some exclusive that's, that, that, that kind of, you know, where they got Final some Final Fantasy or whatever. It didn't really pan out. Um, but, I mean, we have to announce games. We just can't launch a console with no games because it's cartridge-based, right? Yeah. So we, we have to include games. I mean, there's never been a Kickstarter like this where you've got the console. This is what we're Kickstarting over here. But right alongside it is these 20 <laughs> games. And some of these have already been developed, some haven't, some are in early stages, and um, you know some of these were kickstarted previously that they're 
you know, currently making. They'll be available by the end of this year. And, and so, you know, there's going to be a mix of games and ports that we're going to be announcing with the Kickstarter. Um, but essentially, it, it, it's pre-order for all of these games, for all of these developers. So in that 45-day period, we're going to know how many of Pure Solar HD did we sell, right? How many of Gunlord did we sell? And then, uh, you know, if the game is already done, you know, we'll have, you know, probably have milestone payments to the developers to help pay for the porting cost. But, you know, they'll essentially get paid some money up front right out of the funding of the Kickstarter because, I mean, that's going to be figured into the that, that total budget that, that's coming, you know, for, for this Kickstarter. So um, in a sense, we're kickstarting the concept so, and, you know, a group of games to go along with it, you know, because when this thing ships in a year, we want we want to at least have these 25 titles guaranteed to ship and be available when the game comes out, when the system delivers. Right. Okay. And uh, and then give people the opportunity to kind of pick and choose which ones they want to get first, you know, with their system. And uh, we're going to do really cool things, I think, for the Kickstarter campaign. The cartridge colors may be different. Um, I know Tiny Knight, we're going to put on a gold cartridge, the retail version after that won't be on a gold cartridge. Uh, we've talked about, depending on the, what the demand is and how many of these we sell and how many games we end up selling, like the first five, 500 of every game we sell may be a special limited edition color or something or label. And uh, these will just be randomly inserted into boxes and put out into the distribution channels. And, you know, somebody will buy one at their local game store and open it up. And it'll be, well, I got one of the 500, you know, gold cartridges or translucent cartridges or whatever. You know, just have just a ton of fun um, kind of, uh, you know, with the collectability of this thing again. Because that that's a fun element of, of gaming. That's why we're all, you know, scouring garage sales and flea markets and swap meets and ebay and craigslist and everything else um kind of the thrill of the hunt so uh, i think that's just a, a, we're gonna be able to do some really cool things that just a huge company would never do okay. all right that does it for me joe did you have anything else <laughs> that that's it i'm i'm uh plumb out of questions but uh mike i w- want to give you uh, an opportunity to say some more stuff if you have anything that you felt we didn't uh, talk about or you oh, want to uh... I think we've covered it all um i mean obviously there's still unanswered questions so uh, like i said just everybody needs just needs to stay up to tune uh, watch the facebook page and and the fact page and we'll try to start getting more specific and and um now that the hardware is locked down hopefully we can start showing some board designs and and some uh block layout block diagram stuff like that you know that the hardware people kind of like and and see that um you know, this is all real. And that um, Facebook page is Retro VGS, correct? Yep, yep. Just Facebook.com slash Retro VGS. And then Retro VGS.com is the uh, the website. Okay. And, um, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on. I, I appreciate you taking the time and talking with us. And uh, definitely be keeping our eyes open on, the, on that Kickstarter for sure. Yeah, and let me know when your show goes up. We'd uh, love to promote it and uh, help you. You know, bring some uh, new listeners potentially to it as well. So. All right, cool. And did you say you're going to too many games? I'm not. They wanted me there. They were, you know, they were going to put me up in a hotel even. And I just I had E3 last week, and then I also had a family re- reunion, and um, uh, I I need to follow up with those guys and let them know I'm not going to be there. But uh, it was it's really a shame because the Mighty Number no. Nine team is going to be there, and um, and um, you know they were going to try to set up a meeting with me with them for me, and I just you know, we just you know. I've got a real job yeah. on top of all of this. You know, this is what I'm trying to get out of. And uh, even with the magazine and the website and everything else, I've still got a full-time job, you know, regional uh, job working on my house. I've been with this company for 10 years. And, and right now, this is just starting to take over. You know, I'm, I'm spending, you know, considerably much more time uh, with the magazine, with the console than I am with my real job. And I'm, I need to get this to a point where I can jump in full time. And so we're hoping that the Kickstarter will aid in that, at least getting us a small team working on this full time, because a venture uh, such as this, you, you really need to be able to focus on this thing 100%. So we're, it's been busy, busy time uh, the last uh, year and a half, two years since I started the magazine for sure. And this console is just going to, you know, hopefully take it to that next level for, for my team. Yeah, yeah, well, um, all the best moving forward. Cool. And, uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me on, guys. We'll talk to you later, maybe. All right, take it easy. Okay, yeah, bye.